I'm Susanna Baker, the author of the book and Bible study, Restore, Remembering Life's Hurts with the God Who Rebuilds. And thank you for joining us again on this journey of restoration. Today is session four. We're going to be talking about restoring through prayer. At the last session, we talked about how the Psalms help us in the process of restoration and secure attachment, something I like to call grace-based attachment. And we specifically looked at the path of restoration David takes in Psalm 32. But today I want to talk about how prayer on a consistent basis helps us to restore and move toward a place of secure attachment by looking at a few specific places in scripture. So the first thing on your outline is why prayer is restorative. Why is prayer restorative? What does prayer do for our our souls and our relationship with God? Let's read Jesus' words in Matthew 6, 5 through 15. This is the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they might be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door, And pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The first thing that jumps out to me about this passage on prayer is this. This is on your outline. We pray to our Father, to our Father. In 11 short verses on prayer, Jesus uses the word Father six times. He could have used any other word for God. And we see him do that throughout the Gospels, Lord, Master, God. But he uses the word in connection with prayer, Father. And what this tells me is that the primary stance in prayer with the Lord is Father to child. We are his children. And what that also tells me is Romans 8 says we are his children through adoption, through the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how we were rescued from the domain of darkness and adopted into the family of God. So the next thing on your outline is that prayer is the language of adoption. The first thing Jesus tells Mary Magdalene the morning of his resurrection is go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And that's because the good news of the gospel is this. You have a father. You have a father, a father who moved toward us by slaying the animal in the garden back in Genesis 3, like we've talked about, who provided the Passover lamb in Exodus 12 for the deliverance of his people from slavery and who gave his son's life as a sacrifice for our sin so that we could be securely attached to him in relationship, father to child once again. And we could live in his presence and his home forever. So when we begin the journey of restoration and moving towards a place of secure attachment, what we have to remember is this, the language we have to learn, and it's a learned language, is the language of adoption. We're insecurely attached because even though we have a good and perfect, loving Heavenly Father who has adopted us into His family, we still have a mentality of an orphan. We act like we're on our own to figure life out. But prayer is the language that teaches us how to relate to God as our Father, how to be confidently, appropriately dependent on Him as His beloved child. Prayer helps us not just know that we are the beloved, but how to become the beloved, how we walk it out in our day-to-day lives. This is why adoption is so powerful. It's a living picture to us of the journey each one of us has to take as believers in Christ, as sons and daughters of God. 
So as the church, we have so much to learn from adoptive parents and kids about our posture in prayer and how we move in our identity to adopted and beloved and chosen and wanted. And so how does prayer help us do this? I want to understand. I want us to understand this today. How is prayer restorative? This is on your outline. Consistent prayer, remember that day in and day out, showing up before the face of God, something we have to do sometimes a lot before we feel any different, but it's slowly and gradually building this foundation of trust and a language of uh, relationship with him. But consistent prayer keeps us dependent, connected, and securely attached to God as his children. Consistent prayer keeps us dependent, connected, and securely attached to God as his children. Remember, God's desire is relationship with his children. That's why he asked Adam and Eve questions back in Genesis 3 and asked us questions. He wants access to our hearts. And prayer keeps us going to him for exactly that. It moves us just from asking for the things he can give us to simply desiring his presence. It moves us from, we do need forgiveness from sin. We do need uh, to forgive others for the things they've done. But like we talked about in Psalm 32, it then moves us to that place of intimate relationship and friendship with God, not just being curbed by bit and bridle like uh, an animal, but out of relationship as his child. So think about what the psalmist says in Psalm 73, whom have I in heaven but you? Earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion my inheritance forever. This is the goal and the movement of our prayer life. God becomes our desire. He becomes our portion. He becomes our inheritance. He becomes the steadying, satisfying source in our lives. Something that's helped me tremendously in this journey of attaching to God to meet my needs as my father um, is listening to a a guy named Adam Young. He's a therapist in Colorado, and he has a podcast called The Place We Find Ourselves. And he has excellent tools on his podcast and on his website for helping us understand what secure attachment is, how you know if you need it, and how to move towards it in just really simple and clear and helpful ways. And one of the things he says is that as a child, to be securely attached, you needed the following six things from your parents. And these are all on your outline. I'm going to give them all to you at once, and then I'll go back and explain them a little bit further. But you needed attunement from your parents, attunement. You needed responsiveness. You needed engagement. You needed uh, the parents who had the ability to regulate your arousal. You needed parents strong enough to handle your negative emotions. And you needed parents who had a willingness to repair. A willingness to repair. So go back to the first one, attunement. This is what we need. We were wired to not only need these things, but receive these things. We needed parents who were attuned to us so they knew what we were feeling. A parent that is distracted by their own needs or wants or emotions or personal pain cannot be attuned to their child's needs. Maybe you had parents who wanted to be attuned to you but couldn't because of circumstances beyond their control, like sickness or death or a lack of emotional resources themselves. Maybe they were too preoccupied with their own emotional pain and didn't have resources to seek help, to stay tuned to you. The second thing that you needed from parents for secure attachment was responsiveness. You needed parents who responded to you when you were distressed, mad, sad, or afraid, and you needed them to offer comfort and care and kindness. The third thing, you needed parents who were engaged. You needed parents to have an internal intention and genuine desire to truly know you. You needed parents who pursued relationship with you and who were willing and able to engage with you on a heart level. Next, you needed parents who had the ability to regulate your arousal. And what this means is you needed parents who were able to soothe you whenever you were anxious or scared or stimulate you when you are shutting down. A child cannot regulate his or her own arousal. He or she's utterly dependent on their mom or dad's ability to regulate it for them. So if you had a mom or dad who is capable of helping you regulate your arousal, then they enabled you to learn how to regulate your arousal as an adult. 
how to calm your anxiety, or how to spring to life again when you were going numb. The next thing is you needed parents who were strong enough to handle your negative emotions. Now I know this is really get, this gets really tough when you have teenagers in the house, like I do right now. But you needed parents who welcomed your anger and sadness and fear. You needed to be free to express negative emotions, to cry or be angry or fall silent, knowing that yes, there would be consequences because your parents are just, right? but you would be given mercy and you would be given grace and responded to in a loving and meaningful way. And finally, you needed parents who had a willingness to repair. No parent is perfect, right? But you needed parents who are willing to rectify the harm done when they hurt you. A healthy and secure attachment is not built on the absence of failure, but on the willingness of the parent to own and rectify failures when they do occur. That's so important to understand. So, Adam Young says, what mattered to you as a child was not that your parents got it right each time, but that they recognized when they missed you or hurt you and responded in a way that brought comfort and reconnection. So if you had those six things on a regular, consistent basis, most likely you were securely attached. But if you did not, and you haven't purposely worked on moving towards a place of earned secure attachment in these areas of your life, you were and still are insecurely attached but you still need those things no matter how old you are. You still need those things in order to flourish and walk in right relationship with God, yourself, and others, and with your own children if you're a parent. So this is the repair work we have to do. This is what's so encouraging though about moving towards secure attachment as an adult. The parent that we're moving towards is fully capable and always willing to do all six of those things. To, for his children at all times. And while God's word helps us begin to see how we relate to others around us, what does righteousness look like? What does flourishing relationship look like with other people? Prayer is what helps us work it out. We go to him with our very real need for attunement, responsiveness, engagement, the ability to regulate our anger or our fear someone who's strong enough to handle our negative emotions and someone who is always willing to repair when we come to him and are honest and repent. And prayer is what helps us stop and take assessment of our hearts and our lives and say, I am not on my own to figure this out anymore, nor am I reliant on past broken or dysfunctional patterns of behavior. I have a good father who waits for me to turn to him who's always willing to repair when I've sinned or blown it and is never too preoccupied with his own emotions or demands of his day or own sadness or pain to be present to me. There's no other parent like him on the face of the earth. That's so powerful and comforting. He is always moving towards us, right? And the cross of Christ and the resurrection of Christ is what proves that to us. So and this is on your outline. As we pray, Regularly telling our story to God, who invites us to hear it through a different lens, we shift our primary attachment from our earthly parents to our Heavenly Father, looking to Him to meet all of those six attachment needs. Again, this is so amazing and hopeful because you are working, even though it can be a painful process, it's hard to remember, it's hard to pay attention to the very real emotions that go on inside of us and have to learn a new way of relating to God, to ourselves, to other people. But all the work that we do is ends in hope because we're working to securely attach to a perfect parent. I mean, that's amazing, right? So this is not, again, it's not an easy fix. It's not a seven-week Bible study program. It's a lifelong journey of learning how to walk in right relationship with him as our good father. And prayer, consistent prayer, is what helps to do that for us. Uh, where we are reading and praying God's word back to him. A place in scripture and specifically in the Psalms that has helped my heart and mind heal and really understand how God as my parent is capable and waiting to, and willing to meet those six attachment needs is Psalm 139. And this Psalm has so many facets. It's so beautiful. It's been a Psalm that has drawn my heart and has been like medicine really for my soul, really kind of started me on this whole healing, restorative attachment journey about 13 years ago when I was pregnant with my daughter, Lizzie. 
Um, but and it, I see new things about it all the time. But it is considered to be one of the summits of Old Testament poetry because it's so beautifully written and it kind of has this high, holy, lofty language, but it's also so intensely personal. And it's such an invitation for us to insert the details of our own story into it. So you're going to look at this psalm later on um, in the book a little bit more in depth, but I want to use it as a framework today to help us understand how God meets these six attachment needs. So I want to read Psalm 139, uh, verses 1 through 24. And as I read, I want you to listen, and I want you to listen and look for specifically God as our Father meeting us in those needs of attunement, responsiveness, engagement, ability to regulate our arousal, strong enough to handle your negative emotions, and willingness to repair. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain to it. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shale, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. How beautiful is that? The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. All, woven all throughout this psalm is the language of secure attachment and the way God meets those six basic needs we have from a parent. If you feel comfortable doing so, I would, as I go through these quickly, I would encourage you, write them in the margin of your Bible by, by the verses so that you can reflect on them, meditate on them, memorize them. And when you get in moments where you need, your emotions need regulating, or you have strong emotions that you need help processing, you know where to turn, right? But in this Psalm, in the language of verses one through six, and 13 through 16, we find a God who is attuned to us and engaged with us. He searches us out. He discerns our thoughts from afar. Before a word is on our lips, he knows it. He is acquainted with all our ways. When you are in the pit of loneliness or despair or feel rejected or numbed out, God is always as your father moving towards you. And the greatest need of your soul to be known is met in him. Your work and my work when we feel those urges to be known by other people or to call or text or check, so check social media or chase someone down with conflict or numb out with alcohol or food or shopping or pornography, it is to stop. Think about Psalm 139, 1 through 6. How do you want Lord to know me right now? What are you saying to my heart? His touch, his voice, his words, his sight, his knowledge of us has to become enough and it, because it's what our hearts are looking for. So learning to look to him for those needs of a parent who is attuned to us and engaged with us. In verses 7 through 12, 
and 17 through 18, we see a God who responds to us. He responds. He doesn't explode in anger when we've blown it. And he doesn't passive aggressively withdraw and make veiled comments about how um, wrong we are, right? He, we see there is no place we can go where he doesn't move, respond, and go after us. He is a father who's constantly with us, right? Even the darkness is not dark to you. It's as bright as the day. Even in the height of our sin or pride, when we ride on the wings of the dawn and fall in foolishness, He's with us. He's there to pluck us out and respond to our needs. He's with us in the pit of depression and loneliness and despair. And even in the darkest places, that word darkness means a darkness so strong you can feel it. It's like bruising. He sees us and his presence illuminates our night. In verses 7 through 12 and 19 through 24, we see a God who's able to regulate our arousal. When we run out of fear or flee from his presence as David did, right? He says, "Such no the knowledge you have for me is a little intense. I'm out, right? And he runs. God is able to calm us down. His strong right hand uh, steadies us. It pulls us out from whatever pit or unsteady sinking ground we're standing on. And he puts us in a secure place. And when we hate our enemies, I mean, is that not bizarre to anyone else, right? He's saying, how precious to me are your thoughts. I love you so much. And then he's like, slay the wicked. I hate them, right? We can go from zero to 100 in a moment. And God is there to help us stop, pause, take a breath, calm us down, and help us pour out our emotions to him and regulate our arousal. In verses 7 through 12 and 19 through 22, we see a God who's strong enough to handle our negative emotions, very similar to what I was just talking about. But he doesn't fly off the handle in rage or lecture or try to control or manage our behavior. He stays present to us. And David trusts God enough to know he will stay present to him in the negative, overwhelming emotions and then stay to help them work through them. He invites God in. He trusts God enough to say, search me, see me, uncover and expose me, know me, help me understand the anger and the rage and the flight and the darkness, the coping, and then lead me, lead me in the way everlasting. And finally, in verses 23 through 24, we see a God who is always willing to repair. This is a beautiful hope and promise. Again, this is not worked out in a moment or a stroke or with a formula. It's worked out day by day, failure by failure, hurt by hurt, moment by moment. All of these things are worked out through prayer, through prayers where we say, search me, O God, and know me. See if there be any grievous way in me. That word grievous means idolatrous, hurtful, or painful way. I can't see the inner workings of my heart. I can't see how the patterns I'm stuck in or the path I'm walking is going to lead to destructive behavior, but you do. So search me and know me. Work this out in me. Show me the ways I need to repent to you, repent to other people, change, right? And we see a God who is attuned and responsive, engaged, able to regulate our deepest fears and heal our deepest hurts, strong enough to handle our wildest emotions and always willing to repair. He always applies the blood of Christ to the guilt of our sin and the shame of our inadequacies, inadequacies and failures to lead us in the way everlasting. To help you to continue to process through some of those big six needs as they relate to um, insecure attachment, I have specific verses from the Psalms and sort of the hurts or the lies or the wounds that they cover and help heal um, in the back of your Bible study uh, workbook. And my husband and I, my husband who is insecurely avoidantly attached, and then I'm insecure, uh, ambivalent attached, and we both are in that, in that process, work, worked, working through the process of towards secure attachment. But we sat down together and drew from our personal journeys, um, the lies and hurt we had to pray through and the verses that helped us the most and wrote those out. So they're coming from two people who have made this journey as well with you. So my prayer is that 
through the tools, through the raised roads, like we've talked about in Psalm 84, that God has given us through his word, through the Psalms, through prayer, through community and the counsel of believers, you and I would continue to walk day in and day out on a consistent basis, this journey towards restoration. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for being a father who is perfect in all your ways. Whatever failures that we have made as parents ourselves, whatever hurts we wrestle with from the past, you are able to completely heal and fill. So would you come and do your restorative work in us and through us? And would you make us people of prayer who love your word, who love your ways, and trust you as our good father? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.